Emerson L. Richards was uh, a very successful, very powerful state senator whose vocation was, was uh, politics, but avocation was an insatiable love of the punk organ. He came from a very successful family in real estate, so he didn't have to worry about money most of the time. And because of that, was able to do his work politically and then spend the rest of the time studying pipe organs, going over to Europe, took a tremendous interest in, in the organ as an instrument and how it's evolved over time. Usually politicians don't get involved in music, but Senator Richards had the foresight to build this instrument. It's part of the culture of the world. Senator Richards was a man with a vision. He definitely had some kind of an insight into what he expected to be able to hear when this organ was completed. And all the engineering skills and all the, the technical skills that went into putting this organ together um, had to be magnificent. He studied, he toured, he wanted to know everything that he could know about pipe organs. He brought his ideas to this country from his studies in Europe and so on and carried out his dream by producing several pipe organs as a consultant and designer and really changed the direction of American organ building quite significantly. And this instrument, by the way, is not just a collection of lots of interesting tones all thrown together. It's a very carefully designed and very carefully worked out plan of ensembles. This is a truly classically inspired organ in many ways. And it was perhaps uh, one of the uh, leaders in, in developing a uh, classical structure in American organ building. Senator Richards took the lead in pipe organ design. He helped formulate the tonal schemes for what would later be known as the American classic organ. Richards wrote numerous articles in the trades and became a respected contemporary of some of the most prominent organ builders and theorists, including George Ashdown Audsley, Hans Steinmeier, Henry Willis III, and G. Donald Harrison. He cited these men as influential in his ideas and for the success of his designs. He was in a position to work with the people who were planning this building, and I think he just decided that he wanted to build the largest organ in the world. He was an absolute fuss budget about things being perfect on this instrument because he sensed what it was going to be in the history of organ building. Here, he had a wonderful reverberant space where the organ could sound incredible, and he wanted to make sure that everything was done to enhance the effect that it had in this room. Because he broke ground, did things that no one else had ever done in terms of voicing, in terms of making sounds work because of the size of the room, and because it was so eminently successful, we have to save it so that younger people and historians who are coming into the organ business will be able to see the failures and successes in trying to come to an ideal aesthetically. Jean-Louis Coignet, who is the chief curator of all organs in Paris, considers this one of the most important instruments of the world because of what it represents in organ building's history. Over the years with my association with the Atlantic City Convention Hall Organ Society and the organ, I have had an opportunity to look at this building, to see how the building is put together, to see how this instrument is put together, to see the, uh, the late senator's thought and belief on what a municipal organ should be. But Richards could not have created this landmark pipe organ without Charles Seibert Losch, president of the Midmer Losch organ building firm. Losch, a native of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, was a self-taught musician who'd led several small orchestras as a student. Upon graduating, he joined his father in working for the M.P. Moeller music store. His flair for the profession made him a pioneer in sales of pipe organs to cinemas and theaters. After 13 years with the firm, Losch was ready to move on. In 1920, he and brother George purchased the Midmer and Son organ building firm. Riding a wave of theater organ sales, Midmer and Son prospered and was renamed Midmer Losch in 1924. 
In the mid-1920s, Losh crossed paths with another inventor named Thomas Edison. Designer of the Edison phonograph, Edison also sold organ recordings under the Edison record label. Midmer Losh designed and installed a three-manual, seven-rank theater organ at Edison's Columbia Street Recording Studio in West Orange, New Jersey. Organist Frederick Kinsley would make a number of recordings for the Edison label, featuring this and other Midmer Losh organs, including instruments located at the Midmer Losh factory on Long Island and the Hippodrome Theater in New York City. One very interesting thing about this instrument is that it was built by a very small company, a company that was uh, perhaps the 10th or 12th largest uh, in the country, not the, the great big uh, factory builders. Seibert Losch particularly was a, a real inventive character. He wanted to do new and different things, make the organ better. Oftentimes people like that get bad reputations because whenever someone jumps out and tries to do something new, uh, he'll always make a few enemies. But Seibert Losch, I think, deserves uh, a lot more credit than he's been given. Midmer Losch was known by some as a very good grade B builder. My friends who have inspected the instrument, who have worked on Midmer Losch's in many other locations, almost don't believe the same company built it because their quality of workmanship here was absolutely stellar, was as fine as any of the finest builders in the history of organ building. Absolutely superb uh, workmanship, the, the woodworking, the, the voicing, the uh, quality of pipework, uh, the attention to detail in every way was built the way the senator wanted it to be built. The general conception of the organ has to be that of one person, but he must have lots of help. For example, in modern pipe organ building, just as it was at Atlantic City, we have one person to design the mechanism, that's a technical designer or engineer. We have to have another person to design the pipes, that's called a tonal designer or a tonal director. Then we have to have people to fabricate the organ, tremendous number of artisans required to build all the various parts of a pipe organ, from the pipes themselves through all the mechanism. Then there has to be a visual designer to design the look of the organ and the look of the console. So it's a cooperative effort to make a pipe organ, and that's only the beginning because then that team has to cooperate with the designers of the building, the acoustical engineers, the architects and so on, the engineers, because the building is really part of the organ, and the organ is part of the building. They're interlocked, and they must work together. And then finally, there has to be another partnership with the musicians. There's an incredible symbiotic relationship between the guys who make the art of the mechanical machine that works and the gentlemen who play it. You're working as a team and everything the builders have done to improve the instrument, the organist uses artistically. We hold the keys up, they push them down. This is not just the largest, but one of the, the best manufactured and well thought out instruments ever built. Uh, the effect it has on people in a space like this, where you take in the visual and the audible together, is profound. And it is, to me, one of the best indicators of the incredible entrepreneurial and uh, always forward-thinking spirit of our country.